Thomas and Robbie Musa and I are so happy to be with you. Uh, as you may know, the National Spiritual Assembly is meeting this weekend as it did last weekend. And so we're unable to be with you in person, but we're happy to be able to join you virtually. And we'd like to begin with a letter from the National Spiritual Assembly to all of our brothers and sisters at the Arise Conference. And I'll read that letter. To the participants of the fifth annual Arise Pupil of the Eye Conference, dearly loved friends, it is with tremendous warmth, affection, and admiration that the National Spiritual Assembly greets you as you embark on five days of meaningful discourse in a space designed to foster healing and discovery for the fifth annual gathering of the beloved friends of African descent, referred to so lovingly in the Baha'i writings as the pupil of the eye, through which the light of the spirit shineth forth. As you come together over this Juneteenth weekend, a holiday of historic significance that still has implications for the state of racial justice in this country today, we call to mind the supplications of the Universal House of Justice in its July 22, 2020 message to the Baha'is of the United States, in which it writes, we ardently pray that the American people will grasp the possibilities of this moment to create a consequential reform of the social order that will free it from the pernicious effects of racial prejudice and will hasten the attainment of a just, diverse, and unified society that can increasingly manifest the oneness of the human family. In the coming days, as you visit places replete with meaning, such as the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and hear from many distinguished speakers whose work in the area of racial and social justice is illumined by the light of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. You will all, it is hoped, be inspired to continue the urgent work of building vibrant communities when you return home. Whether through activities that promote expansion and consolidation, social action, or participation in the discourses of society. May every friend in attendance wholeheartedly engage in the exigencies of the nine-year plan in his or her respective clusters. For your spiritual insights are critical in assisting all of us to achieve the goal of releasing the society building power of the faith for the transformation of our communities. The steps you are taking are bold. The conversations you are having are meaningful. The relationships you are building are essential. The friends gathered in this conference embody the qualities of high-mindedness and high resolve. Yet when you face those challenges and setbacks intrinsic to the deeply unsettled age in which we live, may you draw strength from the words of the Supreme Body, your commitment to tread this road with determination and insight, drawing upon what you have learned in recent years about translating Baha'u'llah's teachings into reality. 
will have, will have to be sustained until the time anticipated by Shoghi Effendi, when you will have contributed your decisive share to the eradication of racial prejudice from the fabric of your nation. The National Spiritual Assembly assures you of its abiding love and its heartfelt prayers that your every endeavor as a part of this great global spiritual enterprise may attract bountiful blessings and confirmations. With loving Baha'i greetings, the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States, Kenneth E. Bowers, Secretary. Well, friends, this morning, uh, we would love to provide you with a little bit of background and framing for the strategy of becoming the leading voice on race unity and the oneness of mankind in the American nation. And uh, to start us off, our sister, uh, our sister Robbie Musa will provide uh, background and framing. And so Robbie, let me hand it over to you. It's great to be in this space and to be with all of you. Um, it was mentioned earlier in, in, in uh, when at the end of Robert's uh, sharing of the greetings from the uh, National Spiritual Assembly that um, I would be providing some further information. And so um, I'm gonna proceed to do that now and provide as Robert indicated some context. So um, just by way of background, uh, the, at, the, at the US National Convention this year, which uh, we just came from, this was just last month, the Secretary of the National Spiritual Assembly, Mr. Ken Bowers, um, in sharing with the community some of the major strides that had been made over the past year, as well as future directions, mentioned that the NSA would be establishing a desk devoted to uh, the development of an approach to facilitate systematic learning about how the society building powers of the faith can be harnessed and directed towards promotion of racial justice in the US through engagement uh, in fulfilling the goals of the nine-year plan. And so during the question and answer session that followed the secretary's report, one of the delegates asked if the NSA could elaborate more on this desk uh, and its functioning. And a response was provided. And um, following this, an, uh, an invitation was extended to share here in this space what was presented at the national convention in response to the question the desk, about this desk and its functioning. And so this will be shared very shortly, but you might find it in, in, informative uh, to have some background um, on what preceded the decision to move in this direction. And so I'm gonna share some of that with you now. So just a little bit of history here. So prior to the launch of the current nine-year plan uh, that was referenced in the letter that, that uh, Robert just mentioned, just read, uh, we were engaged, meaning the Baha'i community of the United States and indeed around the world, in prosecuting the goals of multiple plans that had been given to us by the House of Justice that spanned a period of 25 years. And while the ultimate goal of the past, the current, and the future plans has always been world peace and unity, there was a prevailing view in the United States, among many, that the work of the plans in which we were um, engaged was not dealing adequately with, with one of the criteria that is essential to world peace, which according to the Baha'i writings, as you know, is the unity between blacks and whites in this country, here in the United States. And so one of the <clears throat> stages where the NSA heard from the community about this um, over a period of years, many times at the national, was at the national convention. And ultimately this concern was relayed to the Universal House of Justice and one of the results of that was that members of the two most senior institutions in this country, namely the Continental Board of Counselors and the National Spiritual Assembly uh, were invited to the World Center in Haifa to consult with the House of Justice on this question. And this occurred in 2016. And so following that and the guidance that emerged from that, this began a series of sustained communications that the NSA disseminated to this community um, on the subject of race, uh, both in you know, letter form, uh, independently to the community, and also in the form of, of peace letters, for example. And so following this, 
uh, back in 2019. It's been referenced. There was the first Arise conference. Um, and so the NSA was, was engaged in learning some of the tremendous learnings that emerged from that. And then following that, we had the unfortunate and horrific murder of George Floyd. And then at that time, around this time, uh, uh, the two senior institutions, this is the Continental Board of Counselors and the NSA, uh, came together to form a race working group to study and understand the issues pertaining to race in this country and the guidance in our writings around race and also from the Universal House of Justice on the subject of race with the goal of devising a systematic way to move forward. And so during this time, uh, the House of Justice sent two seminal letters. Uh, one you may recall was the May 9th letter, May 9th of, of, of 2020, uh, which outlined and placed into context um, the current uh, and future turbulence that we're experiencing and described the posture that should be adopted in terms of how we should handle it and how sh we, should, we should view it. And then there was the seminal 22 July 2020 letter on race sent specifically to this country uh, by the House of Justice. It was um, the first such letter really sent by the House of Justice to this country in the past 30 years. And so this guidance from the House of Justice on race provided a, a, a lens through which we can view the approach uh, that the community should take and the NSA should take in leading the country on the subject of race. So um, this race working group that I referenced a little bit earlier uh, was comprised of three NSA members, is comprised of three NSA members and three counselors working together. And um, over the period uh, following, right after the, Arise, the first ARISE conference and um, immediately following that period where we had all that, race, that unrest in this, in this country following the murder of George Floyd, the, this, this race working group met for over a year, essentially every single week, two hours each time, immersed in a study of race, its social dimensions, the spiritual uh, aspects and all of this. And so when the House of Justice announced the nine-year plan in the 30 December letter, the NSA took the decision to work towards becoming the acknowledged champions of the oneness of humanity by the end of the nine-year plan. And this was not in the spirit of triumphalism, but really simply illustrating or indicating a commitment to doing the work that was required. And so this was announced at the April 2022 National Convention in the, in the Secretary's report, in Ken Bauer's report. So uh, in the course of the past year, we've got one year of the current nine-year plan under our belts. The NSA took the decision following all of that study and the, the tools and the infrastructure that's been developed to establish a desk devoted to the development of an approach to facilitate the systematic learning about how the society building powers of the faith uh, can be harnessed and directed towards promotion of racial justice in the United States as we engage in fulfilling the, the goals of the nine-year plan. And so it was aspects of this that were shared at the national convention and uh, that we were invited to share here um, in this space with you. So uh, what I'm gonna do here at this juncture is share what was shared at convention about um, the elements of this, of this initiative. And then at that point, we'll open up the floor for questions. So uh, essentially, Speaking about what it is that this desk is going to be tasked with doing, and, and its, its activities are going to undergo change and refinement over time as, 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 as we move forward in this process. The idea is, first of all, to conduct a census of current Baha'i initiated activities related to race, um, utilizing various information streams. So there are information streams um, that come from entities that have already been set up, for example, the learning desk at the National Center. But there are also information streams, for example, that are coming out of grassroots initiatives like this very Arise conference that we're, we're participating in now. Next would be to build a comprehensive initiatives repository that collects and monitors information in real time or as close to real time as possible in terms of what people are doing on the ground to move forward uh, this, this, uh, the learnings 
and the progress on, on race just, racial justice and race unity. Then devise an information mapping system, uh, one that among other things maps and connects various initiatives to the um, goals of the nine-year plan. And then to develop an analysis approach um, to study that system. So uh, we want to record the insights that are being learned from this and create spaces where what is being learned can be harnessed and canalized. So um, essentially, the power of the grassroots initiatives is going to come in part from um, harnessing it, collecting it, channeling it, and directing it in ways that allow the entire American community to benefit from the learnings and to replicate them in local communities and, 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 and uh, uh, um, apply them regionally. We want to develop a process for harmonizing the diversity of worthwhile approaches towards fulfillment of the goals of the nine-year plan. And we want to be deliberate about harvesting and operationalizing the learnings on the subject of facilitating this transition of populations from one class of core activity to another uh, core activity. For example, bridging between entry points for children's classes to the entry point for the junior youth program and bridging from the junior youth program to uh, the, the uh, youth programs and then bridging from those to um, the institute process. And what we can learn about that within the context of race and the lens in the form of the 22 July letter guidance on race that has been provided to us by the House of Justice. So those are essentially the highlights of this. And so what we want to do at this point is open up the floor for questions so that um, it is your questions that really guide the, the dialogue that we have so that we're not focused on things that are not necessarily of interest. We want to focus on those things that are, that are questions for you or even comments and things that you'd like uh, to have considered. So with that, I will pass the baton on to whoever is uh, facilitating the uh, consultation and the dialogue. Okay. okay. Ooh. <laughs> oh, that's, that's groovy. <laughs> There you go. I'm telling you. No, this is super Ooh. BT. <laughs> Here we go. Are we? <laughs> yes. Oh, hey, Robbie. <laughs> hey. Although we didn't have it in our plan to go back to the 60s this month. <laughs> so um, there's a note in here that says they'll type the questions for us. So that's fantastic. Okay, so the, the first question is, what is the timeline for starting the race desk? Um, the short answer to the question is that there hasn't been a timeline that is that has been set in stone, but uh, it will be initiated as soon as its structure is, is uh, as soon as we finish with the composition of its structure. And so um, there hasn't been a date set for that, but it will start as soon as that structure has been established. Let me just add uh, one additional point. Uh, ordinarily, the National Spiritual Assembly begins the implementation of the annual plan uh, earlier in the spring. But this year, because of the Baha'i International uh, Convention, the, con the National Convention was held a month later. And so we're a month late uh, beginning a process that would have begun uh, in uh, April or May uh, in an ordinary year. Yeah. So all of this is happening in real time. Yeah. And and uh, as we go into the summer and into the fall, uh, we'll begin to make systematic efforts uh, to build a desk, to orient it, and to deploy its uh, services and uh, activities. A lot of the work that has been done prior to the establishment of the desk was done by the working group, uh, by the race working group of the National Spiritual Assembly uh, and the counselors. And uh, Kenneth Bowers, Robbie Musa, and I uh, have been on that race uh, working group. And literally, we have spent uh, two hours uh, once a week and sometimes more 
uh, for well over a year, uh, looking at every aspect of race and the American Baha'i community and the larger issues of race uh, in the American nation. And by that, I mean spiritually, socially, politically, and economically, uh, because this whole mission of society building is not just a mission of spiritual conversion or, or, or uh, conversion to the Baha'i faith. It is also a mission of building new political systems, economic systems, and social systems that have to support a unified and integrated American nation. Uh, so uh, this race working group has been delving into things like the economic implications of race in the United States. Let me give you an example. Uh, we looked at, we had a very extensive uh, reading uh, responsibility. And one of the things that we looked at uh, were books like The Sum of Us by Heather McGee. Uh, and in that we learned that the cost of racial discrimination in the American society over the past 20 years has been about $20 trillion. And that going forward, the cost of continuing to discriminate will be about $3 trillion per year. Well, that's enough for universal employment, universal health care, uh, universal child care, the elimination of homelessness, and, and so on. And so when we take that into consideration, we ask ourselves, how does that fit into the work we're doing in clusters, the regions, and the nation uh, to advance policies and systems and practices that will begin to build a consciousness and a pattern of action that will reverse those trends? Uh, so all of this is, as I said before, it's being constructed in real time. Uh, we are doing this work now. But preliminarily, uh, we had to go to school on the wide range of issues that are associated with the dynamics of race in the American nation and in the American Baha'i community. And, that's, and that was the, the setup work being done preliminary to the establishment of the desk. Robbie, you may have points to add. I guess I would add that it's important to, it's important to state that it's not that there's no work on race and we're waiting for a desk to do the work. Uh, as uh, Robert alluded to, um, we've been, we've had this working group and we have been uh, taking a very, very deep dive into this and just making sure that it aligns with the goal of how to, you know, harness the society building powers of the faith um, and, and, and help the United States and all of humanity. So essentially, um, in addition to the work that's being done by that race working group, which already exists and has existed for over two years, we will be transitioning, transitioning to a more formalized structure that actually has um, a form that is devoted singly to this issue. Um, and, and so that's, that's what I would add. Robbie, perhaps we could partner on a, on a response because I really, uh, first of all, let's go back to the assumption that we're building this now. Mm -hmm. But that being said, there is an awful lot of work being done on building uh, communities that are united in their diversity and begin to a, a, a approach some of the social challenges that, that we face and particularly communities of color face all over the United States. Uh, assembly is in the in the uh, Atlantic states right now, consulting with the regional Baha'i Council of the uh, Atlantic region about a uh, systematic uh, pattern of community development that begins way back in the late '60s with entry by troops in Adams Run, South Carolina, and evolves into the current implementation of the plan. Now, Robbie mentioned that the work of the desk will begin by collecting, evaluating, and disseminating information mm -hmm. about what's being done. And we'll use that information to organize trainings and to accelerate knowledge transfer so that everybody will know what people are learning, 
about building integrated and united and harmonized communities. What they're learning about social action on race, discourse on race, uh, and dealing with different populations from children to adults to uh, political systems and institutions uh, uh, and the like. So all of this uh, is going to be collected and shared in ways that can be translated into training. Now, a number of, of uh, local assemblies are doing big things on race. And Robbie, you might want to mention what the Northwest region has done. Uh, in response to the National Assembly's letter to the regional councils about developing a, a race unity uh, strategy uh, in each one of the regions. Yeah, um, so thank you for the question. Um, this is, there's, there's a lot here to unpack, but briefly I'll just add to what uh, Robert was mentioning. One of the things that, um, uh, you all may be familiar with is a recent letter. Uh, is it, I think it's the 20 March letter of, of, of this year, Robert. Maybe you can let mm -hmm. me know if the date 20 is March. correct. 20 March. And in that letter, another seminal letter, guidance from the, from the House of Justice, one of the points they make is that now that we've built some infrastructure, we need to decentralize so that the the, there, there, there's less and less micromanagement at the level of the national institutions and much more know-how that is developed at the regional level and at the level of local spiritual assemblies, which has to do with your question. And so the, so, so the idea is what sort of leadership can the National Spiritual Assembly adopt to, to help at the regional level, regional councils um, to assist local spiritual assemblies in these areas, including this, this area of, of race. And so part of what we're having to do is sort of rethink the structure of how these things are administered. And rather than um, having, a central, having a centralized mindset, really having this be decentralized and develop these capacities at the grassroots. So one of the things that the National Spiritual Assembly has done is invited regional councils to consider key questions around race. And hearkening back to this idea that the House of Justice tasks us with doing certain things, and then as learnings emerge at the, at the grassroots, we can take those learnings and deploy them. One of the learnings, um, some of the learnings have come, emerged from the Regional Council of the Northwest. And so uh, they began a process uh, following the following correspondence that was sent to all regional councils by the National Spiritual Assembly of doing a listening tour of the uh, African-American Baha'is and friends on challenges that they're experiencing in their communities and then allowing that to be a guide through the lens of the guidance that we have in our teachings, but most notably the 22 July letter of 2020 on, on race from the House of Justice, um, community activities, making sure to sort of center the perspectives of African-Americans in the community. And so there's a series of initiatives that they've, they've launched. And so there's lots of learnings that are coming out of that. Now that's exactly the kind of approach that we wanna take in alignment with the guidance of the house where we don't just imagine things. There's a wide latitude for experimentation uh, that is afforded to councils once they get this invitation. And then it's when we try things out and we actually see what works and what is emerging that then those learnings can be harnessed and then disseminated. So we're doing, we're basically walking and chewing gum at the same time. So on the one hand, we're learning about things, but at the same time, we're harnessing those learnings and developing a mechanism whereby they can be systematically disseminated and then deployed. So this is the the the, the structure that that is that is the, the or the shape or the form that this is taking. Let, let me just uh, add an addendum to that, and that is uh, when the representatives of the National Assembly were in Haifa in 2016, and again when we returned uh, just last September, the House of Justice uh, reiterated the importance of this uh, focus. 
And essentially what they said to us was, we need to take the long view. Mm -hmm. We need to imagine what we want to accomplish as a community and the kind of impact we want to have on our nation within the next nine years and in the next 25 years, and then work backwards and figure out where do we start in order to have that kind of impact. Now, the other thing that they said to us is they wanted us to start focused on this issue and never stop. Mm -hmm. And they wanted us to multiply activities, systematically integrating them into everything we do, our systems, our policies, our institutional practices, and so on. And I would just uh, point out to you that you can already see the evidences of this in some of the larger metropolitan local spiritual assemblies, because one of the uh, unanticipated consequences of developing sector organization in the early development of clusters was a kind of residential segregation in the American Baha'i community. Uh, suddenly, you had communities that were feast was in the black neighborhood, the Latino neighborhood, the white neighborhood, or where the persons lived. And that was not conducive to the kind of unity and the kind of impact we wanted to have on community building in the larger uh, community. So in a, in, a, in a letter, the House of Justice transformed that by reestablishing two-stage elections in large metropolitan uh, local assemblies. And what that meant was that every sector would elect delegates who in turn would elect local spiritual assemblies. Well, what, what that meant in New York or San Diego, in Los Angeles, was the transformation of the membership of the local assemblies themselves. And all of a sudden they became instantly representative of all of the colors and races in the community, just overnight. Mm -hmm. and, and it became, uh, it, it reestablished a loud and strong voice of every people in every Baha'i community. So this is one of the spiritual powers of the, uh, of, of the leadership of the Universal House of Justice. And you can see how uh, through their guidance and through the establishment of this new system of election, we have re-enfranchised and re-included uh, folks who felt themselves to be at the margins of the Baha'i community back into the leadership of the Baha'i community. And this is, uh, this is tremendously gratifying to our hearts, but we wanna build this system out through the clusters, the regions, and the nation as a whole. Well, one of the things that the National Assembly did uh, in order to help the uh, Persian friends understand the dynamics of race in the United States was they translated the advent of divine justice into Persian because the advent of divine justice was written in English and there was no Persian version of that document. And yet this is the grand design for the development of the American Baha'i community and its spiritual conquest of the nation to fulfill its destiny to establish uh, world peace and, and uh, the oneness of humankind. So, so there is a study guide and a translated version of the Advent of Divine Justice. Uh, as I said, uh, the National Assembly is right now in, the, in uh, Loudoun County uh, mm -hmm. at the Northern Virginia Baha'i Center. And it is consulting with uh, regional councils in the Atlantic region, Northeast uh, and, and the like. And um, one of the things that we have been talking about is the leadership that is being demonstrated by some of the Persian friends uh, in the area of, mm -hmm. of race and how to spread what we're learning about uh, inspiring and uh, involving that community in the larger effort to build unity and diversity. But I'm happy to say that there is uh, activity uh, and, and, and powerful and uh, effective activity in that area. Uh, but of course, we have the ongoing challenge of spreading it out and spreading the news and inspiring other hearts uh, to join those efforts. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. We're, we, Iranian friend, 
respectfully ask, basic on the Wilmet course and all the things that are happening, what are, what are some of the things that can reach our Persian community as well as encourage them to take the Wilmet course or some of the things and be actively involved because they're at the uh, ground level, there's still a lot of challenge and kind of separate communities. What is the NSA thinking about doing to educate our Persian friends and bring them into it? We, you've talked about how much knowledge the NSA has uh, uh, and the learning. How is that knowledge being disseminated to our Persian and perhaps white friends? Forgive me, I'm, I'm looking up a quotation, hold on. For, for, first of all, I mentioned that the advent of divine justice was written in English and there was never a Persian translation of that document, but now there is. And there is a study guide associated with that. So just understanding what the mission of America is and understanding what the Guardian said about our obligations to build an interracial community and the transformational effect that would have on the American nation and the world is important to the complete understanding of the mission of being an American Baha'i for any of the uh, Persian friends. But second, um, it is simultaneously true that there are communities where there's a lot of work to be done among the Persian friends, and there are communities where a lot of work is being done by the Persian friends. Mm -hmm. And so when Robbie talked about knowledge transfer as being one of the uh, routine uh, capacities that we're gonna build into the desk, that's one of the areas that we want to uh, highlight. Uh, because we can accelerate the participation, the understanding, and the spirit of the Persian friends in unity with, with the uh, emphasis on race by sharing what front runners are doing uh, today. Uh, because, you know, th th this is a huge community. There are 15,000 places where Baha'is live in the continent of the United States. So almost anything you say about the American Baha'i community is true somewhere. Uh, and so one of the truths is that there are a number of, of places where Persian friends are in the forefront of this, uh, of this work. And we need to share more about what they're doing, how they rose up, the effects that they're having, and what they're saying to um, their other Persian brothers and sisters and, and to others about their uh, involvement. And uh, we, we have not shared that systematically in the past, but that'll be one of the uh, efforts that the desk undertakes. Okay, thank you, Robert. Um, some things that I'd like to add. You know, we've alluded a, a number of times to this idea that the approach that the House of Justice has asked us to adopt is one where we monitor activities that are happening at the grassroots to actually see what is working and what's getting through, and then take those learnings and then multiply communities where we can disseminate those learnings so that everyone can benefit. So there are, there are a few things here that I wanna tie together on this point. And uh, Robert, I'm gonna need your help uh, on the aspect of it that deals with the, was it the article in the National Review on the impact of race trainings? Oh yeah, America right. No, it, it was a Harvard Business Review. Well, Harvard, Harvard Business Review. Right, right. So I want to just share some learnings. <clears throat> One of the learnings, so, so let me start off first of all by saying that there's this wonderful tablet, this from Abdu'l-Bahá, this is what I was looking up, where Abdu'l-Bahá talks about, he alludes to this idea that, um, you know, it's easy to please God, but it's actually not that easy to please human beings <laughs> or to get them to change. And he himself, Abdul Baha, has had great difficulty. And then he asks this soul to pray that he can have influence. My point is that our writings tell in, in our in Baha'u'llah, the, the pivot around which the teachings of this faith revolve is unity and the oneness of, hu of humankind. Abdul Baha has talked about race unity. He set up a race amity conference right here in this country. Many of his talks were about this subject. The Guardian wrote a whole letter that is so long that it's in the form of a book, The mm -hmm. Advent of Divine Justice, as we well know. Mm -hmm. And you know, Robert indicated that that 
text was actually translated so that there could be a better understanding of the nature of this issue and what needs to be, be done about it. And then the House of Justice has written extensively on this issue and provided guidance. One of the challenges we face is the perspective that well, there, there are multiple challenges, but one of them is that if people are exposed to trainings, they'll change. <laughs> and um, research has shown both in corporate America and certain initiatives that, that we've been monitoring at the grassroots that while participation in a, tra in a training around issues of race uh, may make the people who are been marginalized feel better. It actually, in many instances, causes people to become more set in their ways than they were before. And so it actually has, it, it, now I'm not saying this is true in all cases, but in many cases, it has limited efficacy. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we're exploring is, huh, well, in those instances where we're seeing things work, what is it that got to those souls? Right. What is it that caused the transformation? So it's not just training for, for the sake of training. Yes, we may feel that, wow, if this person only understood the history, if this person only understood how I feel when such and such is said, if, if they only stood that, would, if they only understood that they would change, we are finding in many instances that that's not true. But we're also finding instances where people are changing and it's not necessarily trainings that are doing it. To the extent that we're finding that trainings do accomplish that, that's great. We wanna harness that learning and, and disseminate it. But there are other things that we're finding that are moving souls where many of these friends that um, are from populations that have been, um, that, that, that people typically associated with a lack, associate with a lack of understanding we're finding that they're, 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 in some instances, they are actually at the forefront. And many of us can tell stories about that. So um, in this regard, I wanna bring up the second issue, which is that, you know, many of us are long suffering and we come from these communities where it's just year after year, decade after de decade, we're tired and there's no, no movement or there seems to be no movement. And one of the reasons why there seems to be no movement is that those same folks in that same community, there's been no change. I mean, friends, the, your National Spiritual Assembly over the past three years has sent a number of letters to communities. And we still have situations where if the, if, if the letter is about race, we know, we get the feedback that there are communities that decide, oh, we're not gonna read this letter. It's too long, or you know, everybody study it on their own time, you know, that kind of thing. So, so you know, the, the thought is there's no change because those people aren't changing. But the House of Justice is inviting us to consider a different paradigm. And it's the paradigm associated with the idea that our community is not those 93 people that we've been with for the past 25 years or whatever. It's the city, it's the town, right. it's the full population of the cluster. And so while back when I was growing up, the friends of God, that term the friends was used to describe people who were declared Baha'is, which meant that there was a contrast between them and non-Baha'is. So the, the friends in your community were de the declared Baha'is. In a recent letter, uh, one of the more recent letters where the House of Justice was inviting us to consider, us meaning the National Spiritual Assemblies, <clears throat> how to assist regional Baha'i councils in putting together that series of conferences that we had uh, following the, the commemoration of the, of the uh, ascension of, well, the commemoration of, of you, you remember the two commemorative events we had recently in the, a couple of years ago. When we were engaged in that exercise, the House of Justice said, we want you to have these conferences. So we put on these conferences and there was guidance. And in that guidance, one of the things that the House of Justice did was they referred to friends, not as Baha'is, but as essentially the people 
who were in our entire town or city or cluster. When we broaden that out, we and we suddenly realize that there's this community and the community is not just declared Baha'is, but all the other like-minded people who were working alongside us to bring to fruition the, the fundamental spiritual reality of the teachings of Baha'u'llah, then we realize that there is movement. Significant. Significant movement. And the population of individuals who can collaborate with us and think the same things, think in the same ways we do on these issues, that community is far greater than just that, you know, those 93 people we were with. So it invites us to sort of shift in the way we consider what community looks like and who our allies are, who we can work alongside to bringing these teachings, uh, you know, in the society building powers of, of, of the faith to fruition. So I don't know if that made sense, but it's it's another, it's a, an additional dimension to this. Let me attempt to complement that with a couple of observations. One about uh, the state of the Baha'i community and its uh, broad ranging initiatives on race and the other reflecting on what you said earlier about what we've learned about how to approach this issue in, in ways that will facilitate um, uh, unity and, and understanding and, and sustained cooperation. Uh, first, the National Assembly collects information about social action initiatives every year. And it is a comprehensive survey that looks deep into the American Baha'i community and asks, what are we doing to affect different issues? Over the past several years, we have sustained well over 2,000 initiatives on race throughout the community from New York to California. Now, that may not be happening in discernible ways in your locality, but it's happening all over the United States in so many different ways with school departments, with uh, police departments, with community organizations in neighborhoods uh, and the like. And this uh, information is part of what we want to organize and share systematically so that we can transfer the knowledge of what's being done and inspire more activity that can refine the approaches and expand them. A full stop and refocus on the issue of what we're learning about uh, what race is, how race works, and the, and the work race does. Um, there is a book called The Difference. Uh, it was written by an economist and political scientist uh, named Scott Page at the University of Michigan. And it was one of the first scientific analyses of the impact of diversity uh, on, uh, on problem solving, decision making, and performance. And the question he raised was, we all know we all, all ought to want to get along with everybody of different races and different and different uh, cultures and the like, but does it make a qualitative difference in the way that we work as a community? And what he found was not only does it make a qualitative difference, but it makes a transformational difference uh, with uh, significant uh, improvements in problem solving, in decision making, in uh, performance, and even in financial results of, uh, of uh, companies and organizations. So for example, in problem solving, uh, one of the things that Scott Page found was that um, uh, groups of, of uh, diverse groups of people with general knowledge about an issue consistently out problem solve experts in their own area of expert, expertise, provided their, their approach is consultative. So if everybody's got a voice, if everybody can contribute to a, um, an analysis of the problem and a discussion of options for solving the problem, then uh, they consistently outperform PhDs and doctors and scientists and, and experts in whatever area it is in the development of their solutions. And he found another interesting thing. He found that the bigger the problem is, the better diverse groups of problem solvers do in imagineering solutions to that. Now that's true in innovation, it's true in financial performance, it's true in a, in a variety of areas. Now here's the converse. Uh, in a, uh, a large group of studies that were done about how we create 
interracial understanding and how we begin to build intentional communities, because that's what we're all about as Baha'is. We want to build an intentional community that is united in its diversity at a level of sp uh, spiritual foundation with uh, social structure and systems and policies and practices and disciplines of thought, heart, and behavior that support that unity and diversity. And what they found was that uh, with billions of dollars spent on diversity training and DEI and, and a variety of other things, a lot of that actually resulted in a strengthening of prejudices mm -hmm. that existed before people took the diversity uh, initiatives. And one of the reasons for that was that all of the studies found that when you emphasize uh, a, a grievance driven approach, it isolates people. Mm -hmm and it really drives them to the margins. Black folks get madder, white folks get more prejudice. I mean, it's, that's, that's what the studies have shown. They, they found, however, that when you um, begin to look at, approach, at an approach that focuses on our shared ambitions for the kind of community we want and for the ways that we could contribute our diverse perspectives and experience into building those communities, you get a transformational outcome. Now, this was a synthesis of well over, um, of studies done well over a 20 year period. Uh, and, and as you can well imagine, there are a lot of data and a, and a lot of particulars that I'm just glossing over in a general reprise of the big learnings from that, that, that approach. But here's the bottom line. Essentially what Scott Page found, what, what other scholars have found, and what this synthesis of studies in the Harvard Business Review found was that the Baha'i approach to consultation, the, the Baha'i approach of uh, what did Abdul Baha say? Uh, and by the way, he said this to Nazruddin Shah, who had spent his entire life trying to kill uh, his, uh, Abdul Baha's father and his religion and Abdul Baha himself. Uh, he said that, that, that we should make every alien an intimate friend, mm -hmm. that we should uh, banish any vestige of foreignness. And then he said that we should offer a helping hand to our fallen oppressor. Uh, and so he set the standard for a Baha'i approach to the very challenge that we're talking about right now. And, uh, and interestingly, what we're learning from uh, economists and political scientists and social scientists and the like is that this very approach is the magic key to building unity and diversity with, pe with populations that may be estranged, may be contentious, may not understand one another, but are beginning to uh, build uh, understanding of, uh, among themselves. Now I see the appearance of a genuine expert in this area, <laughs> our, our dear sister and new colleague, uh, June Thomas. And, and I'm gonna tell on Je uh, June uh, before she begins to contribute. Uh, when June was elected to the National Spiritual Assembly, one of the things she said was, yeah, you know, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna, how am I going to join the National Assembly and so forth? And what jumped out of my heart, and, and June, you know this is true. I said, we have been in the habit of loving you okay. for decades. <laughs> and so we don't have to learn how to do that because uh -huh. uh, we know all about it. You've been our sister and our dear, uh, dear sister for so many years that we don't know any other way to relate. So when she joined the National Spiritual Assembly, she just joined a, a, a group of people who've been loving her as a matter of habit for decades. And, and now we have the privilege of loving her up close. <laughs> May I say one thing before June jumps in? Yeah, I, I want to, going back to the question, a couple of questions that have been having to do with, with trainings and the other about building capacity at the local and regional levels. Robert had asked me to comment on initiatives that, have, that are being adopted, for example, by councils. One of the things that the Regional Council of the Northwest did was asked all of the uh, local spiritual assemblies in the region 
to enroll in the, the Wilmette Institute's anti-Black racism course, right? And so the question is, once that happens, what learnings can we harness from that to then have an appreciation of the ways in which that and other such and other programs that the friends are engaged in, the ways in which that can be deployed um, to move this forward. So the, the idea is not, oh, somebody's getting fancy here with all yeah. this oh, yeah. stuff. We're doing big things. Yeah, yes, good Lord. I'm trying. I'm impressed, whoever that yeah. is, I'm impressed. Is, you got <laughs> all right, so, so uh, June, we don't want to hog into your time because you've got important things to say. Yes. But we do want to just convey our love and our constant focus and prayers on uh, all of the friends that are gathered there today and how happy we are just to be able to share a little bit of time with you virtually, even though we weren't able to be with you uh, heart to heart and face to face. Before we go, because I don't know if they can, you, I don't know if you can hear the applause. They're all, they're so oh, happy. No, here. we can't hear the applause. Right. This is the thing because I did it as a webinar so we could get a clean thing trying to do the in-person and all that. But but it's working lovely. Everybody sees you, everybody's happy. There's a couple other questions. <clears throat> and June, you'll still have your time. It says, thank you for sharing about the meetings with the Universal House of Justice. Would it be possible to have a letter to the American community on these meetings and what you learned from meeting with the Universal House of Justice? Because we're all excited when we hear that hear you say, and I heard you, Robbie, at the convention saying how you, and even Bob speaking, that you've been meeting for a year, a couple of hours, but the people don't know that, and they they need mm. to know that. It, 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 it heartened them to know that, so that's a request. Um, was there another question? Uh, I just actually, want to say- Actually, let, let me just mention. Okay, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, a couple things. One, you can hear all about those meetings in the last two uh, presentations of the Secretary of the National Assembly at the National Con uh, Convention because he talked about them. That's right. So, yeah. so, so you can hear the entire story uh, in the in those presentations, and and I think I, I even referred to some of that history in the Treasurer's report this year at the National Convention. But second, the uh, the, the letters that Robbie talked about earlier the series of letters that the National Assembly has sent to the American Baha'i community are all based on that initiative of 2016. Uh, so you can see, just go back over those letters and you'll see the entire arc of the, of the things that the House of Justice told us built into those letters and referred to specifically. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. I wanted to say a couple things. <clears throat> Is that you know, Robbie? Uh, you were there at the first arise, <laughs> and now you're here at the fifth rise. And and I wanted to just point out a couple things. One is how much all of us have grown. I I we last night we had a gala, and we took a book eight picture of all of us that were in this in the longest room running book eight in history. I think we've been going two and a half years with, with Derek. <laughs> so we're all here at the gala last night. Thing. <laughs> Because it became a community thing. It became more than just a book. It became a family. It became all this stuff as we studied. And I and many of you know that in the very first Arise conference, I did not want institutions there. Yes, I mean, I was we, very scared. I think we heard that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I wasn't, you know, and I did the survey and people because it might have gotten around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I really because people say are people institutions because we hadn't built the trust in the relationship. And over these five years, we have built the trust and relationship of our community. And we, that's why we wanted you here. I mean, we, get, we read earlier a letter from the regional council. You know, in that nine-year uh, plan, it said that the, inst the, 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 the individual, the community, and the institutions need to work together. And none of us can reach our full potential. And we're doing it. This is a big learning. And regarding the Persians, um, I want to say, uh, you know, that these conferences uh, would never have gotten off the ground had it not been for the Persians in the background that were yes. supporting me. Yes. You know, I mean, so there are some collaborations and I'm looking forward to when I talk to you guys to share all of that because maybe they weren't invited in the room somewhere because uh, I needed to make sure that you had that nurturing, encouraging, and mostly of all safe environment. But there were people that showed up at that first arise and because I just want to be here to serve you. They were in the kitchen. They were out, you know, cleaning toilets. They did whatever. So behind the scenes that people may not know about, there was a unity and a love of us 
that they said, Barbara, how, what can I do to help? Today, you can't see us because of the meeting format, but we've got Persians in the rooms. We got white people in the room because this is a celebration of what we have done together. It has not been, and very clearly, a space to educate them, people who are saying, I don't know what to do. It's for people that have been in the trenches with us before this, these five years, and definitely in, in over these five years. We've got Huda Husseini in the room, you know. We've got, we, we've got some other people here, you know, that, that are in the trenches with us. And I wanted them to come and, and celebrate with us. I also want to give a real shout out to the National Spiritual Assembly yeah. who, you know, have, you know, sent us a letter every one of those five years and have supported us even more so even financially this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will convey this to the body and it will be, it will really, really um, touch the heart of the National Spiritual Assembly and we'll, we'll be thrilled to convey it. Thank you very much. Yes, you made a lot of people smile here. I, you can't hear the clapping, but they're happy. They're clapping. And so we'll, 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 we'll chat, you know. <laughs> we'll, well, they're going to get even happier when they hear from June. There you go. All right. So we're going to, you know, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I know you had a meeting and you stepped out. I know we had this little thing to get it collaborated and how we're going to do this, but you're here. And, and <clears throat> I'm so very grateful. And I look forward to sharing our learnings from the five years of the people of the I conference with you guys. Okay. There thank you, you so much, Bob. Right. And thank bye you so bye. much, Robbie, dear friend. And now we're going to go to June Thomas. Good morning, June. Bye -bye. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Before my colleagues, well, they're they're leaving, but hopefully they're still on. I just want to say how pleased I am to join this incredible National Spiritual Assembly. And um, I would just like to call out the delegates to the National Assembly, because um, I think if I might be so bold as to mention this, I think the fact that the delegates to the National Convention chose an African-American um, person to join the National Spiritual Assembly is significant. Um, I, I really think it was an example of the, the delegates seeing the need for more discussion about racial unity and racial justice that they they chose. Uh, because friends, you do realize I, I, I was chosen for Joanna Conrad's seat. And you do realize I don't look like Joanna Conrad. You do realize that. So I just wanted to point out that there might be uh, uh, some wisdom that's there that that maybe I can offer just some tiny assistance to the marvelous efforts that, that the National Spiritual Assembly has already undertaken. Um, so, so I want to make a switch even before the national convention. And so, even though before, um, you know, I'm an NSA member as of a month, but even before then, Barbara had asked me uh, to present on this book. And so, I'm going. Thou art like unto the pupil of the eye. Like unto the pupil of.